All right. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it, it has been a long time since we've been in here. The Lord has led away. There's some other things I had to cover that weren't covered in, in morning preaching and such. And uh, such as it is, it's been, it's been over a month, I believe, since we've been in here. Uh, but in chapter 4, he was talking about the afflictions of, of Christ and, and uh, that, you know, in verse 16 it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Uh, we talked a little bit about that in uh, the washing of water by the word that helps in that renewing process. Uh, it helps with the, the process of um, having our minds renewed in Christ, uh, renewing that mind of Christ in us. And, and uh, as we talked about this morning, there is a mortifying of the flesh. I guess it was in the men's class we were talking about mortifying the flesh. And there's a mortifying the flesh that has to happen. It's a daily dying unto the Lord. And, and that's what he says here. You know, we, uh, 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 verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And so if there is new life in Christ in you, we ought to be bearing that about in our bodies. All right. And so this is, this is kind of where we're tying all of this into. Now, once we get on into further into the chapter here, we're going to see some things about the judgment seat of Christ and uh, all of this. And, and I find it very, um, I don't like the word ironic. It, it's just the Holy Ghost leading and guiding and such. But the things that we've been looking at in, second, or in First Peter, uh, we've also kind of touched on in the morning preaching at other times. And now here we are uh, back in Second Corinthians, and the Lord led me to this before I even realized that this stuff was in here, really. And so we're going to be looking at all of this, examining all of this. Uh, as we were looking at that uh, in First in Peter chapter 4, that is dealing very much with the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, and Jesus Christ's uh, afflictions being played out in our body and how we are saved from judgment as he brings these things to our mind, uh, we will all have to stand before, before God, uh, Christians, unsaved alike. We will stand in before Jesus Christ, our eternity paid for and sealed and already judged. The sin, uh, our sin was laid upon Jesus Christ and was judged at the cross and in the fires of hell and sealed by his re resurrection. And so that is not what our judgment seat is going to be. Our judgment seat is going to be much different. However, as we're going to see, we're just reading in verse 10 really quick. Uh, we're going to see that there is a judgment seat that we will have to stand up against. Okay, now watch this. Uh, verse 10, for we must all be appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Okay. Uh, now, I've, I've heard it preached that this is, you know, we'll receive the rewards, but we will see the things that we should have gotten, but the bad things in our body, you know, are hindering that. But that's not what this says. We will receive for the things done in our body, whether it was good or whether it was bad, okay? And this is a, it, it ought to be a, a warning to us because that next verse says, therefore, uh, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. All right, now I don't want to preach all this uh, too much to begin with, um, but we'll get on into chapter 5 here, and we'll see what, how this all plays out. Chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Now, of course, this, this is an allegory. He's using this as a type. That tabernacle, a tabernacle is, is a tent, basically. That tabernacle in the wilderness was made to be temporary. It was not a permanent dwelling. Okay? It was made to be torn down, taken up, and carried away, and then set up again. Okay? And then when the Lord said to move again, they would get on in and move and then continue on. And so Paul is, is likening our bodies, this body, this flesh that we are living in, as a tabernacle. Okay? This is just our temporary dwelling. This is not our permanent dwelling. This is not what we will be spending eternity in. There is a dwelling that is being prepared for us in heaven. Okay? This is what it says. Uh, Jesus Christ himself talked about that in saying, uh, if I go away, I prepare a place for you. Okay? And if I go away, I'll come again and, and all of this. Um, in fact, we were talking, uh, we, we had opportunity to drive out to Erie and have our yearly annual bike ride. Uh, Ten years, I think, we've done it in a row now. And uh, it was a blessing of a time and all. Uh, 
But on the way out, we were talking about just various things of the Word of God, and, and we got around to the idea of, uh, in my father's house, there are many mansions, okay? Um, the common thought of that is, and, and this is kind of spun that way with uh, the newer versions, what they'll say is, in my father's house, there are many rooms, okay? And I've heard, you know, good staunch preachers say, ah, I'm not, you know, living for the Lord for a room, I'm living for a mansion. Well, let's pause for a second. What does the word house mean in 1611? Why would the Holy Ghost use that word house? What does it mean throughout the word of God? It is not talking about a dwelling. It's not talking about the building. This is the house of God, but this is not the building of God. Okay? A house in the word of God, if you study that thing out, when somebody talks about their house, they're talking about their lineage and their heritage and their family. Okay? Uh, the people that live in that house, that home across the way, that is the house of Seely. Okay? It, it's comprised of Philip, Natalie, Russell, Austin, and Trevor, and then all the various and sundry animals that we have. Our funny farm, so we like to speak. Um, that is what a house means. Okay, so in my father's house, there are many mansions. Well, what does a mansion mean? Okay, what would a mansion have meant? to a first century Pharisee. Why was that word chosen? Why did the Holy Ghost use that word to describe that Greek word? Okay, um, so these, these are the, the conversations we were having and, and I love tearing the word of God and bringing it and pulling it apart and, and looking at these various things. And when you look at those words, you, you get a broader understanding of what's going on. A mansion is a, a grand dwelling, okay? Um, I personally believe that this house that is being prepared for us is, number one, in some aspects, placed in that New Jerusalem, okay? There's a full study of that that we're not going to do tonight. Number two, I believe this house, this mansion that is being spoken of, is what's being talked about here. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven, okay? This is talking about being put on the family of God in the presence of God. This is being put on that new lineage. This is putting off. You see where it says here, for in this we groan. In Romans 8, he also talks about, Paul also talks about uh, the creation groaning. And we talked about that this morning for the, re uh, for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Okay, All of creation is groaning for that, and we ourselves groan in the same thing. And he's talking about this, the redemption of our body. This is this new body, this Christ-likeness where our flesh will finally be adopted. He says, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Okay? And so this type of thing, this eternal house in the heavens, this eternal home, this eternal abode, this eternal dwelling that we ourselves will be a part of and will be in, it is an eternal thing. This is part of that eternal life which is spoken of in John 3.16. Um, and John 3.15 and 3.16 use two different words. It, there's uh, everlasting life spoken of and then there's eternal life spoken of. Everlasting life has a beginning but no end. It lasts forever, but there is a starting point. That is when your life starts in Christ Jesus. That is when the moment, the instant you are born again, your everlasting life has begun. But what is that eternal life that he speaks of? Well, this is the life that we now live in the flesh. We live by the faith of the Son of God. That is an eternal life. That faith of the Son of God is eternal life. Uh, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. All right, so in him is life and life abundantly. And so that life is eternal life, has no beginning and it has no end. That's what eternal means. It's outside of time, completely removed from time. Time has no bearing on that aspect of life. And we have that life as well, okay? Uh, this, is, this is part of the, uh, it's part of the blessing, I guess we can put it that way, of being a child of God is all these various aspects of it. I mean, you're more than just have a, a home in heaven for eternity and you're never going to even once experience just a, even a second of the fires of hell. Okay. That is one great thing about it. 
but it goes far beyond that and it is far deeper than that if you examine these words in their context and what they're talking about and how they ought to be defined and what god intends by it i'm telling you what there is so much more than we even know okay uh well in romans chapter 8 as well it says you know in these things um i think it was romans 8 i i could be wrong on that um you know i have not seen or hath not heard that's in first corinthians isn't it uh, neither hath entered in the heart of man things which the lord hath prepared for them that love him okay but then that very next verse says, but he hath shown them unto us by his spirit. Okay. Those things eye hasn't seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered in the heart of man. But God did reveal them to us through his spirit. Okay. So we have knowledge of that. We have understanding of that. How? Through the word of God. This is where all that's contained. Okay. We haven't seen it yet, but we know about it. Okay. Mankind in the world has no clue about any of this, but we can know God exactly as we are known. We've talked about with Ms. Mara this morning. We can know him to the intimate, closest detail because he has given himself fully in this, in this book. Everything, cover to cover, Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 21, whatever it is, 22. Okay? This, this book contains Jesus Christ. This book contains God Almighty. This book, as we study it and as we look at it and we pull it all apart, we can know God exactly as we are known. And there's not a single detail about us that God doesn't know. Okay, So that's, that's one of the blessings of this. But let's continue on looking here. Um, yeah, we'll continue on verse 3. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Verse 4 says, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. What this verse is basically saying is we groan for eternity, not just to get us out of this mess, but we groan for eternity so that we can be clothed upon with our with our, our spotless garments, with our, our new house, our new tabernacle, to be clothed upon with Christ in his fullness. There's a lot of people that are earnestly looking for the rapture just to get us out of here. And that's not what we ought to be. All right, We're not looking for a fire escape out of the mess that's going on in this earth. And it doesn't matter how bad it gets, we ought never to allow ourselves to slip into that mode of thinking. We earnestly groan for Jesus Christ to come back so that we can be with him. All right? Not that we uh, would be able to escape from here, but that we would be able to be in him in his fullness, in our fullness, to be clothed upon with a, the, the new tabernacle. Okay? Uh, verse 5, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God. It doesn't say wrought for us. It says wrought us for the selfsame thing. You realize you are wrought of God. Raw iron is iron that has been taken in its rawest, in, in its rawest form and has been smelted down and then has been put in a fire and then has been heated and worked and beaten and heated and worked and beaten and heated and worked and beaten and, and it's wrought into something useful. Um, that's where we get the term raw iron. Okay? The same thing is what God has done in us. If you're born again salvation is a thing that is wrought of God in you he builds it in you and it comes through burning and quenching and and pain and travail and I'm telling you what uh, those of you who have experienced childbirth understand that term travail okay you know what that's all about husbands and wives alike you've been there you've seen it you know the pain you know the travail of new birth and the new spiritual birth is the exact same way. It, it does not come easy. It's very, very simple, but it is the hardest thing that anyone will ever go through in their entire lives, coming to the end of themselves. And that is what is truly necessary. For you to believe everything Jesus Christ says about himself, you have to believe everything he says about you. And everything he says about you is that there is absolutely no good in you. And that is a, 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 an impossibility for mankind to comprehend alone. God gives that comprehension though. God gives them that. And with that, he gives them repentance and that enables them to acknowledge the truth. Okay, If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. 
And so we as teachers, we as preachers, uh, Sunday school teachers, uh, if, you, if you're a lay speaker, you know, however it is that you uh, serve the Lord, even just preaching in your day-to-day -day life out in the community, we have to be, uh, that, that passage in, uh, I believe it's in 2 Timothy, talks about that the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle to all men, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, and then the rest of that verse. And so we need to have that meekness, understanding that there is nothing in our control that can do anything. It is all entirely up to God. Preach the word. Don't preach your fancy homiletical outline. Don't preach your, your fancy ex, uh, experiences. Uh, there's a place for stories. There's a place for experiences. There's a place for allegory. But uh, I really believe very firmly of what it says in Ecclesiastes, I believe it's 5.2, where it says uh, uh, to let thy words be few. Okay. Let thy words be few. You can say a whole lot of words as long as they're coming from the mouth of God. If not, let thy words be few. Uh, let another man praise thee and not thine own self. This is a verse that God continually brings to me, knowing and understanding that I need that constant reminder because in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And there is that, that root of pride that can, that can still rear its head up from time to time. And that is a thing that is continually being rooted out. Oh, but Satan, doesn't he just love to plant tares among the wheat? And so we have to be cautious on these things, being on guard. First uh, Peter uh, 5, 8, you know, uh, be sober, be vigilant, for the ad your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walked about seeking whom he may devour. And that continual uh, seeking is being done by Satan, but it's also being done by Jesus Christ. They're both seeking. Satan is seeking whom he may devour. Jesus Christ is seeking to save the lost. And he's seeking for men to stand in the gap. Okay? This, is what, this is what is encompassed in that. And as Brother Dale also, uh, I've been mentioning you a lot tonight. Thank you for being able to be used. Um, but uh, just in, in the, uh, the messages that the Lord has been laying on his heart to preach and to teach at some point about seeking God. It doesn't end at salvation. That's really, truly where your seeking begins. And a soul that claims to be born again but has no desire to seek God is not born again. That salvation has not been wrought of God. It's been wrought of man, whether by fear, whether by the precept of men. However it is, if there's no burning, yearning desire for the word of God and to learn of God and to be with God and, and be under the preaching of the word of God and, and just being drawn into him, that's, that's not salvation. That's not what this Bible calls salvation. Okay. Um, so let's, let's keep going here, though. But it says, uh, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. That word earnest, it has the context of a down payment. Okay. Uh, when you are going to be buying a house, you put an earnest it toward the bank, showing that this is, this is my earnest, this is showing I am going to pay this loan off, that, you know, we understand that, okay? Uh, in this context, though, let's look at a couple scriptures here. Uh, turn back, I believe it's to chapter 1, verse 22. Looks, well, actually, let's look at verse 21. 2 Corinthians 1, 21. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Now, you remember to establish is different than establishing. Establishing something is the beginning of something that will continue on. Establishing is setting firmly in place, unmovable, unable to be changed. Okay? Kingdoms are established. Churches are established. Believers are established. So let's look at that again. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ. So where did he establish us? In Christ. That's right. And hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Back over to 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 5. Um, no, I'm sorry. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I apologize. We're going to look at verse 13. Ephesians 1.13 says this, In whom ye also trusted, 
after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after, after, I'm oh, sorry, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That holy is a lowercase h, denoting that it is an adjective, okay? Uh, holy is always an adjective, even when it's being used as a noun, okay? Because there is the knowledge of the holy. Uh, Nathan showed that to me the one day, and we, we talked that out for a little bit, and we found that, yes, it is still an adjective in the noun sense. It's a descriptive noun in that, okay? Um, but here, looking at this, there's a, there's a, a distinct uh, order of things, all right? Uh, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. Okay, so we trust after we've heard the word of truth. Another reason why it's important to be under the preaching of the word of God. You go through life and if you never hear the word of truth, there's going to be a lack of trust of your God because you're never going to know the truth that he has for you. You're never going to know the, the everlasting promises that he has laid out for his children. You're never going to know that uh, even if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Okay? And there is showing a place where our belief is human. Okay? There is that human element to that thing. That is our choice, whether to believe the promises of God or not. Ignorance is not an excuse. Okay? Um, ignorance is much more see this is another one that we've we've begun studying out all the newer versions change that word ignorance okay um, in Leviticus 4 I believe it is when it's speaking of the sin of ignorance what was the word that they changed it to do you remember <sighs> boy I can't remember we'll take a pause on that I'll, I'll come back to that later on maybe but uh, here in, in 1 Corinthians, in whom you, or, or sorry, in Ephesians. Boy, I'm just all over the place tonight. It's because we didn't start with singing, all right? That's what I'll blame it on. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That, that spirit of promise is holy. Okay, yes. Unintentional. Yes. Something that is unintentional is much different than something that is ignorant, okay? When you're ignorant of something, you don't know about it. Something being unintentional means you accidentally did it. You can know about it, but you accidentally did it. You didn't mean to do it, all right? Do you see the, the trouble with that, all right? And I believe Strong's definition of that word is unintentional. So when we go to the Greek for the deeper meaning, we're actually getting American Standard Version, we're getting NIV, we're getting NASB. So our deeper meaning is in the newer Bibles. I'm sorry. If we're going to the Strong's Concordance to find definition of King James Bible words, and you cross-examine them with the American Standard Version, with the Revised Standard Version, with the NASB, with the NIV, with the New King James, his definitions are the exact words that are in those new Bibles. Check it out. Not every single one, but multitudes of them are. Especially these little ones that change like that. Unintentional. Ignorant. Okay? Ignorance is something of, of the such that once you learn about it, you're responsible for it. Okay? God required something of the people of Israel when, he, when they uh, were ignorant of a sin and they knew about it, he required a specific sacrifice from the common people all the way up to kings and priests and everything else in between. And when a whole nation sinned a sin of ignorance, he required something of them. And that's what he was requiring of the Jews when Peter, I believe it's in Acts chapter 4, said uh, that you took and you, you killed the king of glory and all of this. And he says, I want that you did it out of ignorance. What he's showing is you were ignorant of it, but now you know, and you're required to do something about it, okay? But unintentional, whoops, oh, I didn't, I didn't mean to do it, okay? You see the problem there. So, uh, let's, let's keep going in this, though. Um, 
that Holy Spirit of promise, verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now that redemption of the purpose possession to wit the redemption of our body. Okay, so this is speaking of the rapture or the resurrection, whichever side of the grave you're on at that point. Okay, this is what this is speaking of here. Uh, go to Ephesians 4, 30. This next place here. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay, now here we get a little more inclining as to what this spirit is. And when you look at the spirit of God, I believe this is how Jesus Christ, God the Father, and God the Son, sorry, Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, are one. They have one collective spirit that's listed out as being the spirit of God. There are places in the Old Testament, however, where it's being listed out as the method and the mode by which God speaks through prophets, all right? And by way of Peter, we understand that no prophecy, no interpretation of prophecy, or, sorry, no prophecy of the scriptures of by any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, okay? Those men who were moved by the Holy Ghost were moved by the Spirit of God. In that, that is the third person of the Trinity being singled out, okay? Every time you see the Spirit of God coming on somebody and they prophesy, all right? When the Spirit of God came on King Saul, and he prophesied, and it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? Okay, that was the Holy Ghost speaking through him. Okay, the Holy Ghost is the narrator throughout the entire Word of God. When somebody isn't specifically speaking, those parenthetical statements, all of that, that is the Holy Ghost speaking. Okay, I can't say every single parenthetical statement because I know that there are some where Paul is interjecting there. So, but at any rate. The Holy Ghost is behind that as well, okay? We understand that. But the Spirit of God is the thing whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. So it's much more than just the Holy Ghost sealing us. It is much more than just the Spirit of Jesus Christ sealing us. It is much more than just God the Father's Spirit sealing us. It is the entirety of the Godhead sealing us unto the day of redemption. That is our earnest. And this is that spirit which bears witness with our spirit that we are a child of God. That's part of that seal. Okay? This is what comes upon a person at the moment of salvation. The moment they believe unto repenting, uh, repentance and they are born again. Salvation is wrought by the hand of God in them. This seal is placed upon them. And just like the king's seal back in the medieval times meant that that thing was decreed and there was nothing that was going to change it. This is that same seal, okay? We are born of God. Nothing can change that, All right? Now, uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 7. Because in Hebrews chapter 7, we're actually going to see this in a little bit of a different light. Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 22, we see a word that means much the same as earnest, okay? as being a, a, a down payment, a seal, a, a testimony, okay? Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, let's start in, let's start in verse 19. It says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. Oh, and I've got a good verse for that. We're going to get to that in a second, I believe. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made a pri he was made priest. And then this parenthetical statement, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. A surety is the same exact thing as an earnest. All right, when something is surety, when you, uh, you study that word out and, and there is always a striking of hands, okay, in the, in the context of what it's talking about elsewhere, it brings out the idea that somebody has a debt to another person 
and you go to that person and you say, I will pay their debt. I am in lieu of them not being able to pay it. Okay, and so now you are paying that thing. Okay, and what it is doing is it is sealing that person's release from that debt. Now, Proverbs warns against being in surety for a friend because then you are under bondage of them and you are then under their control and you're under their power and it's an evil thing to you and it becomes a, a pain and uh, it's, it's, it's not spoken of well. Okay, so if you are to do that for somebody, be cautious in the thing that you're entering into. Okay, uh, and there's also stocks of striking hands. And this, to, to me, in my mind, it has the context of, of shaking on something. And that is that, that seal, okay? I'm, I'm making a surety and I'm giving you my hand on the thing, okay? Jesus Christ was made a surety for us of that better testament, okay? By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were of many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. All right, those priests that came before Jesus Christ could not continue in that office because of death. Okay, they just couldn't. But this man, who is Jesus, because he continueth ever, all right, there's that word again, ever, that, that again, I, and do, doing some more study of that, that has e eternal in that whole thing. Okay? Ever is speaking of a, just a continuing of time. Now, he hath an unchangeable priesthood, all right? Wherefore, he is also able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Again, that's where we see that that spirit of intercession spoken of in Romans chapter 8 is not the Holy Ghost. It is Jesus Christ himself. He is the one that is ever making intercession for us, all right? Uh, and this is a this is a beautiful thing. The the things that we can see about Jesus Christ and His m continuing ministry toward us, He doesn't just take us and then leave us at the point of salvation and say, "Well, there you go. We'll see you in heaven." No, that is a it is a continual priesthood that He performs for us, ever interceding. As Satan, that accuser of the brethren, comes up and accuses those things that we do in the flesh, He says, "No, I've paid for that. No, I've paid for that. No, I've paid for that." Okay, this is, this is that interceding that Jesus Christ does for us. Of course, there's also that, that uh, idea of intercession where uh, there are groanings which cannot be uttered. Okay, you don't even know what to say. You don't even know what to pray. You don't even know how to pray. Jesus Christ intercedes in that, in his spirit as well. Okay, but this surety of a better testament, that excited me when I saw that uh, in relation to an earnest, that Jesus Christ was made that surety for us. It's a sure thing. It is going to happen. It is a down payment, and he has taken that entire thing on himself. He has been placed in that position of surety. All right, we have that ministry of reconciliation. Okay, back into 1 Corinthians, or sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And verse 6. It says, Therefore we are always confident... Okay, we are always confident. There is a certain confidence that comes from being a child of God. At least there ought to be. There ought to be a confidence in your God. There ought to be a confidence in the Word of God. Now, what Satan will do is try to make you lose confidence in his Word. Okay, and he does this with a myriad of other versions, uh, disguising the truth, just like that, that boy with a scarf around the tree. That leprechaun puts a whole slew of scars around every single tree in the whole place. Okay, so you can never find the truth. He does that by clouding the word of God to us. All right, he will lay temptations and snares in front of us. Uh, Jesus, or sorry, well, it is Jesus speaking, but in the Old Testament, it, it speaks of uh, being released from the uh, the snare of the fowler. I believe it says a fowler is one who who catches birds. Okay. Uh, that's, that's how they, they hunt these birds, is they, they use snares. And so there is this idea that Satan is out there laying these things. But Paul says we're not ignorant of his devices. We know what he uses. We know that he uses division among the brethren. We know that what he uses as far as our lusts and our, our desires and, and our, our uh, weaknesses in the flesh. He knows and understands all of that intimately. By the way, I believe fully that Satan knows every bit of you just about as much as God does. I'm afraid we underestimate Satan's power sometimes. 
Because I think in doing that, the, the problem with underestimating Satan's power is that we lower Jesus Christ's power just a little bit. We know that Jesus will always win out over Satan, but if Satan is powerful up to here, but we only have a view of Jesus, which is right here, we have to make excuses to bring Satan down to put him below. All right? You see what I'm saying here? What we need to do is realize that Jesus Christ is all-powerful and that our adversary, the devil, is very powerful too. Okay? There are many things that he reaches unto and touches and affects in our lives that we don't want to give him credit for. Okay? And so we, we need to be we cautious of that in that we don't underestimate our, our enemy. All right? uh, never read The Art of War, written by Sun Tzu. I don't know the history of the man. I know he's probably a Taoist. But this is a, this is a book commonly read uh, by military strategists and all of this. And the one quote that I remember out of that is to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. And that's understanding your enemy and every aspect of him so that you can counterattack. Okay? The best place to learn your enemy is right here. Because in that, you have a, a very stark contrast between the enemy and our ally. Okay? We know our enemy because we see what God lays out about him. We're not ignorant of his devices because of the word of God. Satan is going to do everything he can to either get you to doubt the word of God or to keep you from it. Right? So these are the things we have to keep in mind. These are the things we have to continually have before us. All right. We are confident. That's where that all came from. Verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, this is a commonly misquoted scripture. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Right? What did I say? Oh, we are always confident. Oh, and then verse 8, it says confident again. How about that? I skipped it. Thank you, my love. All right, we'll get to verse 8 in a second. Verse 6, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, this is, this is quoting Old Scripture, Old Testament Scripture. Okay, I can't remember where it's at at the moment. Um, it also talks about the just walking by faith. Uh, and in the Old Testament, I think it's in Isaiah, it says the just shall walk by his faith. Okay. Um, relating that faith to the faith of Jesus Christ. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Okay, so we, if we live by that faith and we walk by that faith, we'll never stumble. Okay? God has given us everything we need to live, to coin the phrase, a victorious Christian life. He's given it all. But when we get our eyes off of Him, when we get our eyes off of eternity when we stop our ears and when we reject and don't want to receive truth, that's when we fall into temptations and snares, okay? But this part here saying that we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, okay? While our soul and spirit are right here in this, yes, we are seated in Christ in heavenly places. Our spirit is there dwelling in him, all right? We are in Christ and he is in us. He hath made us sit there, okay? But we are absent from the Lord. There is a division even still. We cannot be as nigh as we will be okay, because of this flesh. Now, that's why it's important to mortify our members, uh, you know, dying to the flesh, continually dying unto the Lord. Uh, it says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8 says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. All right, so this is, this is showing that, and taking it in the context of the whole thing, looking at, at uh, all of chapter 5 here, earnestly looking to be with Christ, earnestly listening for that, looking unto Jesus, looking for that appearing, looking for that blessed hope, looking for him to come, listening for that final trumpet. Okay? This ought to be our, our continual mindset and our continual life. But in that, we're not doing that just to escape the trials and tribulations of this life. We are looking for that to be with Christ. All right? Paul said it on this wise that uh, it would be far better for him to go and be with the Lord 
but it would be better for those ones that he was writing to to remain in the flesh. All right? I believe that's in Philippians. And so he kind of relays this same thing here. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from. We're willing. We, we would love to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And the way that this is, is that the instant you are absent from your body, you are already present with the Lord because you're already in him. Okay? Wherefore, we labor. Now there again, laboring is not working. We are not working to keep our salvation. We aren't working even to keep us in God's good grace. But we are laboring for a very specific reason. That whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now, I started looking at this word accepted, and in context of every time this thing is being used, it is generally speaking of a sacrifice being proper so that the Lord can accept it. Okay? You go through all through Leviticus, this is used again and again and again. Uh, in Deuteronomy, he says, uh, if these things are brought to me, will they be accepted of me? Uh, uh, in Malachi, he says that. Uh, in uh, relating to the things that the priests were bringing to the Lord. And he says, you go ahead and offer this stuff to the governor. Will it be accepted of him? Okay. So this, this being accepted of him, this has nothing to do with our position in Christ, but this has everything to do with our walking in him. Okay. We labor to maintain nigh. Okay. With that in mind, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We labor to maintain nigh. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. It says, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. All right? Nothing between. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ, Messiah himself, that made us nigh. Okay? But as we know in Paul's admonitions, cleanse your hands, O you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay? In, in these things, he says, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Well, why would we have to draw nigh if we were made nigh? This is speaking of the initial nigh. Okay? Uh, let's back up just a little bit and look at verse 11 now. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. All right, so the Jews are calling the Gentiles the uncircumcision. Right, that's what that's saying. At that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. All right, this was us before Christ. But now we are made nigh by the blood of Christ. He is broken down. Uh, it says, uh, verse 14, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, both Jew and Gentile, one, and who hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. All right? He's taken that down, removed it entirely, and having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were not. All right, so Jesus Christ preached peace, both to us which were afar off, the Gentile world, and those that were nigh, the Israelites, the Jews. And what he did was he broke down that middle wall of partition that separated Jew and Gentile, made us all one, that he might reconcile us all by his cross to God. All right? Then from there he has given to us that ministry of reconciliation. All right? And that is the, that's the gospel that we preach, that reconciliation. Be ye reconciled unto God. Okay? Um, Ephesians 1, 6, look at that just real briefly. It says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. All right, so 
By the blood of Christ, we were made nigh. By Jesus Christ, in the beloved, we have been made accepted. So why do we need to labor to be accepted? It's to labor to maintain that nigh. Because you walk through a mud puddle, you're going to get mud on your shoes. We're not of the world, but we are in the world. And we are still in our flesh. Because of that very thing, we have got to maintain nigh, and that is a labor. We labor by coming to church. We labor by getting in his word. We labor by prayer. We labor by fasting. We labor by family devotions. I'm telling you what, it is a labor to maintain that nigh between you and God, that there would be nothing between. It is a continual... Let me ask you this. Anybody who has ever pruned plants before, Okay, how many in here have done some husbandry and you've pruned plants, whether it's a tree, tomato plants, flowers, roses, okay, all of that. Yes, even my wife. She's a horticulturalist now. She has maintained flowers all summer long. Brought them back from the brink of death, by the way, I will say. Very impressed by my wife. If anybody knows my wife, she knows she has a black thumb and is very good at killing plants, even fake ones. But, uh, boy, I lost track of what I was saying. Where was I going with all of that? Oh, pruning. You prune it just once, right, at the beginning of the season, and then it never has to be pruned again. No. Um, if you've pruned an apple tree, you prune it in about February. All right, before the sap, the January, February, before the sap runs, okay? Still cold, still frozen. You prune that thing, prune it way back. What happens when springtime comes? Man, there's all sorts of little suckers that stick out everywhere. You got to go back and prune those things. And, and then the branches that are bearing fruit will have more nutrients going to those things. That's the, the idea of pruning, okay? You're not distributing five units of nutrients among 10 branches. You're then distributing five units of nutrients to two branches, okay? Just for a picture in your head, if that helps at all. Helps me, anyway. But in that, Jesus Christ has to prune us continually. And he does that through the preaching of the Word of God. He does that through the teaching of the Word of God. He does that through our own study of the Word of God. These things are brought to our, our mind. They're brought to our knowledge. We're no longer ignorant of them. We lay them before the Lord. He prunes it from us, and we are nigh again. Oh, but then our flesh and our carnal mind, and then he has to show us some more, and, and we're nigh again when he prunes us, and, and that is that laboring. And that's what I believe Paul is saying in Hebrews chapter uh, 4, where it says, therefore, we labor to enter into that rest. Okay? It is a labor, this Christian life. Uh, it's not easy, but... When Jesus is in the yoke with you, it is. It's light. So uh, we're actually going to stop there. Uh, we'll pick up in verse 9 uh, the next time, whenever the Lord has us. Or in verse 10, I mean. And uh, I guess, I guess we'll, we'll close the time of preaching in a word of prayer. Uh, and then we're going to sing our couple of hymns. And uh, we're going to take up our teen offering. And then we'll close out our service. It's backwards Sunday, Mr. T. Amen. All right. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we are able to be in your word again tonight. Uh, Lord, for all those who were able to make it out, Lord, I thank you that you were able to help Miss Lois tonight and uh, that we were able to get those things figured out. I pray for continued healing for her and the others who are dealing with ongoing issues. Uh, Lord, I, I just pray you take these things that we've heard and gleaned from the word of God, and Lord, that you would sink them deep into us. Uh, Lord, that that ground of our heart would be prepared. Father, use it to prune out and to, to root out uh, the stony ground and those, those thorns and those things that would choke the word and make it unprofitable. Uh, but Lord, this night would bring forth fruit unto righteousness for the glory of God. Father, we thank you for it all again. And now, Lord, I pray you bless the rest of our time. In Jesus' name, amen.